Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. If you listened to the 2012 two-parter that previous hosts Sarah and Dublina did about the War of Currents that played out with Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison, and George Westinghouse at the center of it, you may recall that it was a very competitive rush to establish the current type that would be adopted by cities to provide power. Thomas Edison was pitching his DC direct current, while Tesla and Westinghouse were championing Tesla's alternating AC current. One of the things that comes up in the second part of that two-parter is the execution of William Kemmler. But the execution and what it meant to Edison and Westinghouse, as well as society, is only mentioned briefly because, to be fair, it is completely outside the scope of that episode. And it's one of those things that everybody talks about Tesla and Westinghouse and Edison a lot, but two of the other primary players in that story really don't get all that much discussion. And that's Kemmler and the man who invented the electric chair. Uh, so I thought that we would revisit that and focus on the invention, its adoption as a means of execution and some of the, the legal things that were happening around it, and the life of William Kemmler, who was the first man to be put to death in the electric chair. And we're also going to touch a little bit on public opinion of the death penalty in New York in the late 1800s. Uh, heads up that this episode is uh, a little more gruesome than most we've done lately. It includes discussion of domestic violence, animal cruelty, and, of course, execution. And there's a, a pretty horrifying murder in this one. In that 2012 episode, the rivalry of Edison and Tesla is talked about in detail. And they mentioned that one of the ways that Edison was sowing doubt about alternating current was by mounting a lecture tour around the country where animals would be electrocuted using alternating current to really show how dangerous it was. One of the things that's brought up as an example of this sometimes is Topsy the elephant, who was electrocuted, but that was significantly after the War of the Currents was really over, it wasn't really done as an example of how dangerous the current was, but it is a central plot element on an episode of Bob's Burgers. It is. I will just say right now my personal piece. I really don't understand why uh, Kevin Klein hasn't gotten 82,000 awards for that show. And uh, if you want to hear a hilarious musical version of how this went down, uh, you should absolutely watch it. Keep in mind that all of this was playing out when the average person was not really accustomed to the idea of electricity in their everyday lives. Particularly in cities, some people had certainly seen it in use, but really, as you got outside of metro areas, there was a sort of nebulous sense that electricity was very powerful and also somewhat scary. It was still associated for a lot of people with things like lightning, which was, of course, known to be destructive. And that's why it was so important to improve the relative safety of having current run through cities and why Edison was able to play so expertly on the fears of laymen in smearing Westinghouse and Tesla and their alternating current. In the years leading up to the specific events that we're talking about today, there was a lot of discussion about the death penalty, which at the time was being carried out by hanging in New York and pretty much the rest of the United States as well. Many critics thought that this was inhumane, and there were hopes that the technological advances of the day might eventually offer some kind of better alternative Additionally, there was a growing movement to abolish the death penalty altogether in the United States. Enter Alfred Southwick. Southwick was born in Ohio on May 18th of 1826. He attended high school, but that was the last of his formal schooling. After moving to Buffalo in the late 1840s, he worked as a steamboat captain and then became chief engineer of the Western Transit Company, which ran a large-scale steamship operation on Lake Erie. But in the late 1850s, Southwick's career trajectory changed completely. He became a dentist's apprentice. He went on to start his own practice in 1862, which was well-respected but not hugely lucrative. To move up in the dental field, he started to specialize in oral surgery, eventually becoming an expert in cleft palate reconstructions, and innovating in the field through his introduction of artificial implants and a new surgical approach to that. Yeah, it's one of those things where it was not uncommon for people to learn dentistry through an apprenticeship rather than what would need to happen today, which would be a whole lot of dental school. Uh, so while that, to modern ears, may be like, wait, how did he become a dentist? Completely normal at the time. Southwick was also completely fascinated by electricity. 
He got a few scientifically-minded friends together in the early 1880s so that they could begin their own experiments with it using a small generator. In short, they wanted to test currents on stray dogs that they captured, with mixed and often brutal results. Once they had their system refined to the point that it consistently worked, though, this was framed as performing a public service. They were ridding the city of its stray dogs in a humane way. And of course, Southwick got to thinking about how inhumane being put to death by hanging was, and he wondered if electricity might offer a better option. This idea did not go over that well at first, but as he wrote articles about its viability that appeared in various scientific journals over the years, other scientists started to become curious about it. Southwick started sketching out exactly how an electrocution apparatus might work, and he eventually settled on the idea of a chair. Yeah, he had had tried out sketches where the person was standing on a conductive plate and some other options, but uh, one of the the books I read about this kind of hinted that because he was a dentist, the chair, of course, would seem like the most natural way to manage something like this since he did all his dental work with a patient in a chair. On January 6th, 1885, David B. Hill, the new governor of New York, made the following statement in a speech, quote, The present mode of executing criminals by hanging has come down to us from the dark ages, and it may well be questioned whether the science of the present day cannot provide a means for taking the life of such as are condemned to die in a less barbarous manner. I commend this suggestion to the consideration of the legislature. And this was in line with a lot of the thinking at the time, that there had to be a better way to handle death sentences and that science was the answer. In 1886, as stories of botched hangings were becoming more and more common in the press, Governor Hill set up a commission, quote, to investigate and report upon the most humane and practical method known to medical science of carrying into effect the sentence of death in capital cases. On that commission were Southwick, Elbridge T. Gary, the one who investigated Mumler, not his grandfather who invented gerrymandering, and the legal scholar Matthew Hale. There were no actual scientists. Yeah, you could get into semantics about whether or not you could consider Southwick a scientist, but there was nobody that had really, like, spent their entire life studying science. A lot of the reports that they were putting together kind of laid out an assortment of other potential options, including like clubbing people to death and stabbings and very strange ways that people might die and whether that could be somehow codified into being an official means of death in a death sentence. It's a lot to take in. But as part of the commission's investigation into the matter, Southwick, who of course already was into this idea of electricity for it, sent Thomas Alva Edison a letter. That letter was dated November 8th, 1887, and it asked Edison for his thoughts as an expert on the best way to execute a human using electricity, and Edison wanted no part of it. He was against capital punishment, and he certainly did not want his knowledge about electricity used to end a human life. But Southwick wasn't dissuaded. He continued his correspondence with Edison, requesting again in December any insights that the famous inventor had about how one might put a man to death using electric current. Southwick made the case that he was trying to find something more humane than hanging and that Edison's expertise could help get that needed legislation passed. So a month after Southwick had initially reached out to Edison, he finally got the information that he desired from the inventor, who wrote, quote, The most suitable apparatus for this purpose is that class of dynamo electric machinery, which employs intermittent currents. The most effective of these are known as alternating machines, manufactured principally in this country by George Westinghouse. The change of heart was born of a desire to end this rivalry with one swift blow. If Westinghouse's company and its alternating current became associated with execution covered by the press across the country, Edison's direct current would take the day and become the standard. Yeah, we are not digging deep into that rivalry beyond this uh, since that was covered in that two-parter by Sarah and Dublina, but this is just like to explain why suddenly Thomas Alva Edison was like, oh, yes, you could do this, absolutely. Use Westinghouse's current. Uh, We're going to talk about the commission's report that came to fruition after this reply from Edison in just a moment, but first we will pause for a sponsor break. (music) 
So this commission, which is sometimes called the Death Commission uh, in literature of the day, discussed their findings after researching all of these different alternatives to hanging, including electricity, and taking into account Edison's comments on it. Southwick and Hale favored current. Gary thought that poisoning was actually the way to go, but conceded that getting a doctor to administer poison was obviously problematic because it went against their oath to take care of people. But on January 17, 1888, the commission submitted their final report to the New York State Legislature. Southwick's electric chair was the recommended replacement for hanging. The bill to update the law was introduced that very week by Senator Henry Cogleshall. From the moment it became part of the public record, there were endless opinion articles and editorials about capital punishment, whether electricity was a humane way to carry it out, and how a new law like this could be implemented in terms of infrastructure and responsibility for its use and maintenance. Yeah, whether that suddenly fell to the prison to manage or to the government to manage became a big issue of debate as well, even though there were some outlines for how that could happen in this recommendation report. But in a lot of ways, this offered a a strange sort of compromise to people who thought that hanging was outdated. A lot of the debate around capital punishment at this time was carefully worded so that most people who were kind of middle of the road on the issue could say that they were not against the death penalty necessarily, but they just didn't think that the, the system of hanging was really working. And so for a lot of them, electrical current offered a solution to their moral dilemma. This debate went on and on in the press and in the court of public opinion, but the end result after all the legislation was done was that the electric chair bill was signed into law on June 5th, 1888 to take effect on January 1st, 1889. Chapter 489 of the Laws of 1888 of New York made the change to the law regarding how death sentences should be carried out, switching them over to electrical current as the means of death. This amended Section 505 of the Code of Criminal Procedure of New York to include the following passage, quote, The punishment of death must in every case be inflicted by causing to pass through the body of the convict a current of electricity of sufficient intensity to cause death, and the application of such current must be continued until such convict is dead. So that brings us to William Kemmler. And Kemmler's early life is not especially well documented. We know that he was the son of German immigrants born in Philadelphia on May 9, 1860. And his parents had a total of 11 children. But William and four of his siblings, three sisters and a brother, were the only ones to live to adulthood. Kemmler spoke English and German, but he never had any formal schooling and didn't learn to read or write. He helped his father in the family butcher shop, as well as taking on other side jobs to help keep the family afloat. William's mother died of tuberculosis when he and his siblings were young, and his father developed gangrene after being injured in a brawl, and he died when William was still very young. At 17, Kemmler started working in a brickyard, and he saved his wages over the next two years so that he could set himself up in a trade where he could be his own boss. And so... At the age of 19, he purchased a cart and a horse, and he became a vegetable peddler. And he bought vegetables from country farmers, and then he would bring their produce to the city, fill up his cart, and then he went about the streets of Philadelphia selling his wares. So he had a promising start, but Kemmler was also an alcoholic, and that ultimately doomed him. The peddler who did well at managing his business and was good at his job became a totally different person when he drank, and he became violent and unpredictable. It was allegedly during a time that Kemmler was blackout drunk that he got married to one of his neighbors. Sober Kemmler was not interested in this relationship at all, and he attempted to disentangle himself from the whole thing. He already had a young woman that he cared for in his life. When you read stories of this, it's often framed very much as his neighbor being like this sneaky, tricksy woman who dragged him to the courthouse when he was drunk and made him do the vows. We don't really know. That's just how it's often reported. But Kemmler's new wife wanted to stay married. The woman that Kemmler loved, Matilda Ziegler, who went by Tilly, was also married to further complicate things. But her husband of eight years was unfaithful, and she was very unhappy. So William and his paramour Tilly both skipped out on their spouses. They left Philadelphia together in 1888. Before they left, Kemmler sold everything he had for a total of $1,200. And he, Tilly, and Tilly's daughter Emma went to Buffalo, Kemmler started going by the name John Hort so that his wife couldn't track him down. He started up the same business selling vegetables in a new city. Initially, everything seemed to be going well. 
William's brother saw the two of them the following Christmas and reported that they were happy. Yeah, it's interesting. That name John Hort appears on legal documents that Kemmler filed, like, as part of his business license and whatnot, but he didn't seem to actually go by it in his day-to-day life. Like, everyone knew his real name, but it was just a way that he couldn't be traced uh, should anyone from Philadelphia come looking for him through the legal record. The room that William and Tilly rented at 526 South Division Street was small, and their bliss turned sour in those tight quarters, particularly when William drank. According to neighbors, Tilly also had a volatile temper, and the two of them could often be heard arguing loudly. On the morning of March 29th of 1889, neighbors heard the usual yelling. Uh, There had long been some suspicion that these arguments would become physically violent, and while that was the subject of neighborhood gossip, nobody had ever tried to confirm it or to see if Tilly might need help. After the particularly loud argument that took place on March 29th subsided, William Kemmler walked into the kitchen of their landlady, Mary Reed, and he said to her, quote, I've killed her. I had to do it. There was no help for it. I'll hang for the deed. Either one of us had to die. And Mrs. Reed was initially unbelieving until Kemmler brought her Tilly's daughter, Emma, who was four years old at the time, and she told Mary Reed, Papa has killed my mama. So the police were immediately summoned. And while Mary Reed was at a neighbor's asking for help, Kemmler went to a saloon nearby and ordered a drink. He was arrested. Soon thereafter, he didn't resist. A Dr. Blackman entered the room that William and Tilly shared to examine the body and found eggs still in a skillet on the stove, potatoes in the oven, and otherwise a brutal crime scene. Blackman later described it as the worst thing he had seen in the course of his work. Yeah, clearly they had been making breakfast or Tilly was making breakfast when whatever happened took place. Uh, Their table was overturned. Tilly was lying in a pool of blood. She was covered all over in blood. Her heart, surprisingly, was still beating, so an ambulance was called for. And her examination at the hospital revealed that she had been hit in the head with a hatchet 26 times. Her skull was fractured in five places, and her right arm had also been chopped out with the hatchet. She was taken into surgery where 17 broken fragments of her skull were removed from her brain tissue. Despite all efforts to save her, Tilly died at 1 a.m. on March 30th, and her daughter Emma was then placed in the care of Mary Reed. Kimmler was still intoxicated when he was taken into custody and initially refused to speak to police. Then he confessed to the crime, saying that he was not sorry and that, quote, I wanted to kill her and I am ready to hang for it. Over the next several days, his attitude changed. He wanted the modest amount of money to his name, which was $500, to be used for Tilly's funeral expenses. And we're about to get into the details of Kemmler's trial and how this whole thing turns out. But before we get into that next phase of rather heavy stuff, let us pause for a little sponsor break. <laughs> During his time in jail and during his trial, which began on May 7th, William Kemmler shared more details of what had happened on the morning of March 29th. Kemmler had believed that Tilly was having an affair with his business partner, and he had become violent when he was drunk and confronted her about it. During the trial, District Attorney George T. Quinby made his case pretty quickly, pointing out that Kemmler had repeatedly confessed— He then said, quote, There is getting to be a frightful number of homicides, and the punishment meted out to the murderers does not seem to check the crime. It is time that such a salutary lesson should be taught as will have a deterring effect. So he was asking for the steepest penalty available for Kemmler, which would have been death. The jury was given all the details of the crime scene. The surgeons who worked on Tilly were called as witnesses and even produced the skull fragments that had been removed from her brain as evidence. The defense focused largely on how pretty Tilly had been, how completely believable it was that she might have had an affair. Even the testimony of Mrs. Reed was a little dicey for the prosecution, as she said that Tilly started most of the fights with Kemmler and used, quote, unladylike language. The defense also made the case that because of his drunkenness, Kemmler should only be charged with manslaughter instead of first-degree murder. They didn't wish for acquittal because they knew he had confessed, but they wanted an acknowledgement that someone with a drinking problem as chronic as Kemmler's, which they evidenced by describing a series of other events that had exhibited his poor judgment, couldn't premeditate anything. 
They called all of his drinking cohorts to the stand to talk about their binges together, which often started first thing in the morning and went on all day, even as they worked. There was also testimony from a doctor who examined Kimmler that said he was an odd man even when sober, and that, quote, he had suffered from private diseases. Presumably that meant some sort of sexually transmitted infection. This witness, Dr. Crothers, mostly pronounced Kimmler, quote, morally irresponsible. Yeah, that phrase came up again and again in his testimony. Ultimately, after requesting that some testimony be read back to them for additional deliberation, the jury returned their verdict. Guilty of murder in the first degree. When the judge said that he would issue his sentence later that week, it started to dawn on people who knew about the new law regarding capital punishment and electrocution that Kemmler was the first person in New York found guilty of murder since that law came into effect. And suddenly, his trial, which at that point had been reported in the papers, but kind of as like the sensational type headlines about a grisly murder trial, took on all new meaning and importance. If the judge handed down the death sentence, Kemmler would be the first man purposely killed with electricity. On May 13th, that death sentence was announced. Westinghouse covered the cost of a very good attorney for Kemmler, and he knew that if Kemmler was electrocuted with alternating current, as Southwick's chair had been designed to do, it would be difficult, if not impossible, for him to recover from. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court, thanks to that funding. On May 5th of 1890, Roger M. Sherman filed a petition on behalf of Kemmler with the Supreme Court. And that petition read in part, quote, The petitioner is under sentence of death in the Northern District of New York under a statute of New York which imposes the punishment of death by the passing through his body of a current of electricity sufficient in the opinion of the warden of the state prison to cause his death, which current is to be continued until it kills him. The statute also leaves it to the warden to fix the day and hour of his death and contains other features which he here asserts are in violation of the 14th Amendment. These features abridge his privileges and immunities as a citizen of the United States and deprive him of his life without due process of law. After a quick initial hearing, this petition was denied. But Associate Justice Samuel M. Blatchford had also received an application for a writ of error regarding Kemmler's case. That's a request to have the Superior Court review the case and make sure no legal error happened that might require a correction. Blatchford put forth that the application for appeal should be made to the full court, and a hearing was scheduled for May 19th of 1890. This sort of seemed like a ray of hope. And that hearing uh, didn't actually begin until May 20th. Their docket had some other stuff that pushed it back a day. And Kemmler's legal team argued that he had been sentenced to cruel and unusual punishment, making it unconstitutional and outside of due process. In response, Charles F. Durston, warden of Auburn State Prison, made his statement that nothing involved in Kemmler's case was outside of due process and unconstitutional, and that the sentence was in line with the new law. Durston and his team also submitted, as evidence of due process, copies of Kemmler's indictment, judgment, sentence, and execution warrant. The warrant read in part, quote, Now, therefore, you are hereby ordered, commanded, and required to execute the said sentence upon him, the said William Kemmler, otherwise called John Hort, within the walls of Auburn State Prison, or within the yard or enclosure adjoining thereto, by then and there causing to pass through the body of him, the said William Kemmler, otherwise called John Hort, a current of electricity of sufficient intensity to cause death, and that the application of such current of electricity be continued until he, the said William Kemmler, otherwise called John Hort, be dead. The petitioner's response was that death by electrical current, quote, is a cruel and unusual punishment within the meaning of the Constitution, and that it cannot therefore be lawfully inflicted and to establish the facts upon which the court can pass as to the character of the penalty. At the conclusion of the appeal hearing, the court, headed by Chief Justice Melville Weston Fuller, gave its opinion, which was not what Kemmler's team wanted. In an earlier appeal, the court system of New York had issued an opinion with the following as its conclusion, quote, We have examined this testimony and can find but little in it to warrant the belief that this new mode of execution is cruel within the meaning of the Constitution, though it is certainly unusual. On the contrary, we agree with the court below that it removes every reasonable doubt that the application of electricity to the vital parts of the human body, 
under such conditions and in the manner contemplated by the statute, must result in instantaneous and consequently in painless death. On reviewing the previous hearings involved in Kemmler's case, the U.S. Supreme Court did not find anything legally erroneous in the previous verdicts. Their opinion outlines that the New York courts did concede that the manner of death could be said to be unusual because it was new, but that there was every reason to believe, based on the scientific evidence and information available, that it would not be cruel and that they trusted the new law adopting this method had been made based on that information. The Supreme Court's opinion concluded with, quote, In order to reverse the judgment of the highest court of the state of New York, we should be compelled to hold that it had committed an error so gross as to amount in law to a denial by the state of due process of law to one accused of crime, or of some rights secured to him by the Constitution of the United States. We have no hesitation in saying that this we cannot do upon the record before us. The application for a writ of error is denied. And with that, Kemmler's fate was sealed. August 6th, 1890 was scheduled to be the day that the first person would be executed by electric chair. That morning, Kemmler woke up, got dressed, and was escorted by the prison warren to his end in the Auburn State Prison, and it was required by law that the date and the time of the execution be secret. Everyone found out anyway, though, because Auburn was a pretty small town. Yeah, it was a small town, and this was huge news. The last thing that Kemmler said was, Gentlemen, I wish everyone all the good luck in the world. I believe I am going to a good place. The papers have been saying a lot of stuff that ain't so. That's all I have to say. He was prepared with electrodes that were attached to his head, which was then covered with a black cloth. He was strapped down, and then the execution began. Current ran through his body for 17 seconds, and at that point, two doctors who were in attendance as consultants, who were E.C. Spitzka and Carlos McDonald, both believed him to be dead, so the current was cut off. But then, Kemmler groaned. He had a pulse and a heartbeat. Newspapers reported that someone yelled, Great God, he is alive! A second round of current was immediately called for to end Kemmler's suffering. But there was a problem. The apparatus had to have power restored to it to run again, and that cycle took another two minutes before the current could be turned on. That second round, once they did get it turned on, the current stayed active for a full two minutes, and after that point, Kemmler was indeed dead. So this entire event was, as you might expect, reported with revulsion and horror at how it had played out. This was, incidentally, illegal, but the sensational nature of the event meant that newspapers took the risk and went to print with their accounts anyway. The New York Times ran a story with the headline, quote, far worse than hanging. Yeah, it was illegal for them to report details of this whole affair. They could report, like, the the basics of, like, when it happened and what he said, but not sort of the gory details, and they all did exactly that, just the same. Naturally, both... Edison and Westinghouse were asked for their thoughts on the matter by members of the press. Edison commented that this first time had been bungled, likely because of the excitement of the situation, but that he believed that subsequent efforts would lead to instant deaths. He also suggested putting the sentenced man's hands in water and running a current into the jars as an alternative approach to it. Westinghouse simply replied, quote, it has been a brutal affair. They could have done a better job with an axe. An autopsy was performed on Kemmler, and the results indicated that he had lost consciousness instantly, and the problems in the execution had come from poor contact or a voltage that was set too low. Durston, the warden at Auburn, was raked over the coals in the press as a consequence. And while this very first poorly handled use of the electric chair led a lot of people to believe that this was never going to be used again— In July of the following year, New York put four men to death by electrocution on the same day, July 7th. Today, electrocution is still authorized as a means of carrying out capital punishment in nine states in the U.S., although all of those states have lethal injection as their primary method. William Kemmler. It's a a weird story with lots of gore. We did not go into the gory details. If you are wildly curious and want to read them, Uh, A lot of those newspaper reports are pretty readily available online. Yeah. I have way more upbeat listener mail. Okay, good. (laughs) 
<laughs> this is from our listener, Timothy. Uh, he writes, Dear Tracy and Holly, I caught up with your January 6, 2020 podcast, Joan Struthers Curran and Radar Countermeasures, several days before a visit to the Smithsonian's Udvar Hazy Air and Space Museum near Washington, D.C.'s Dulles Airport. Among the exhibits, which include the Discover Space Shuttle, fighter jet, a Blackbird spy plane, and a Concorde supersonic passenger jet, I found a display of World War II radar chaff. Attached our photos along with the display signage. Your podcast put the significance of this small display into context and highlighted its importance. Thanks and keep up the great work. Uh, Thank you so much, Tim. That's so sweet. I'm glad that um, that that kind of added a little extra layer of, of knowledge and enjoyment and engagement for that for you. I actually have not seen that exhibit. I did not know it was there. So now I have another thing on my museum list. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History, and you can subscribe to the podcast on the iHeartRadio app at Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.